2.3.2 comments on the potential. And I missed one, but I'll add it right now. Uh, units. Okay, so first of all, the name. And, you, you know, I wish I could say that the word potential, when I'm talking about the electrical potential, has nothing to do with potential energy. Unfortunately, they do have something to do with each other. And we are going to get to a section where we're going to be talking about potential energy and the electric potential. Um, unfortunately, this is a problem that's not going to go away for the rest of the series and the rest of your life if you take, you know, if you do electrodynamics for, as first as kind of living. Um, but the thing is, is when I say potential, I mean the electric potential. And when I say potential energy, I mean potential energy. And, um, you know, if you catch me using it wrong, you can, you can slap me in the comments or whatever. Comments or whatever. Um, the advantage of using the potential formulation. So this says that we have some vector field that is defined simply by the gradient of a scalar field. And as you know, scalar fields are much easier to write down mathematically because you only need to know basically one component. You don't need to know the, the x, y, and z, or the r, theta, phi, uh, depending on what coordinates you're using. You just need to know one component to get a scalar field. Um, and how in the world is this possible? And the answer is thanks to the fact that the curl of the electric field is zero and will always be zero. Um, we have the a special kind of advantage that the electric field really isn't that difficult of a thing to describe. You only really do need, you know, this one function to describe everything you want to know about the electric field. The reference point O. Um, when you choose O, um, you, it's, it's arbitrary. That's, that's the bottom line. You get to choose whatever you want for the O. Um, there are some values you can choose that are just stupid. Um, there are other values you can choose that are awesome. Um, when you choose a different value of O, you're going to change the potential by some scalar amount. You're going to increase it or decrease based on what the value of the new O is versus the value of the old O, um, which makes life simple. But, you know, just make sure you're consistent with what O you're choosing. Um, the good analogy here is that O, the vector field represents something like a, an elevation map, except for three dimensions. So more like a temperature gradient, whatever. Um, if, so drawing on the parallels of elevation, because we understand that intuitively. So he uses the example, he says like, how high is Denver, right? And our natural instinct is to say, well, we're going to use sea level, right? Well, maybe somebody else will say like, no, I want to use the center of the earth as elevation zero. Or somebody else might say, no, I'm going to use, you know, where I live as elevation zero. Um, but... So usually there's some reference point O that's kind of intuitive. It's like, this is the thing we should be using. Normally, for most problems, for many problems, the ideal value of O is the, the, the electric potential way out at infinity. You know, um, Other times you're going to use something like, um, I'm going to start with the sphere, the surface of this charged sphere as the reference point O. Um, the... Um, There is a problem with using infinity for your O. If the potential does not tend towards some constant value at infinity, like let's say you're dealing with you know, a really long line of charge that goes on forever, or a surface charge that goes on forever, then your potential will not tend towards a common value at, at infinity. And so there's really not obvious what to choose for O in those cases. Fortunately, in real life, those cases don't occur. Right, we don't live in a, un a universe of uniformly charged density, um, but in your textbook problems, you're going to see these. And in certain cases, when you're going to think about things at the very small level, like you know what what's going on inside of a capacitor, for instance, or what's going on around a wire, um, you're not going to have a natural O point to use. Um, but you can always use something. Um, sometimes you can use the surface of the charge itself. Um, uh, the superposition principle. Um, so a superposition principle starts with the fact that you can add forces together. So we can have, you know, the total force on an object is, is equal to the first force plus the second force plus the third force and so on. And each of these forces can be calculated independently of one another, um, especially given the, the way that Coulomb's law works. Well, you know, the electric field is just the force divided by some charge. And so, you know, the same principle applies here. And because V is just, the electric field is just the gradient of this potential, V also, the total potential, is just the sum 
of the other potentials. So this unit, of, this principle of superposition, uh, makes a lot of problems easier to solve. So um, the other thing is, it's a regular sum. These are these are actually vectors. Um, I didn't draw that for you. But these are vectors. So you have to add three numbers in order to get these to work. But the electric potential is a single number. It, you don't have to. It's not. It's a lot easier to add a single number than vector potentials. Um, finally, um, I'll cover the units of potential. It's basically um, unit unit uh, potential is measured in newton meters per coulomb or joules per coulomb. So this is newton meters per coulomb or sometimes joules per coulomb, right? Because newton meters is a thing of work. So it's called a volt, right? It's the V, right? So Voltaire came up with this system, and or we honor his name with this, so it's called a volt. Thank you for your time.